Hello friends, I'm your host, Dr. Dave Layton, and thank you for joining me in our journey to hope. It is my desire through this podcast to bring you information about how to discover, sustain, or perhaps regain hope. Today I'm speaking with Todd Tipton. Todd is the college minister at the Huntsville Church of Christ in Huntsville, Texas. But relative to this conversation, Todd is undergoing treatment for metastatic colon cancer. Now, I've spoken with Todd over the phone a couple of times, and I already consider him a friend. Hello, Todd. Hi, Dave. Well, how are you feeling today, my friend? Honestly, really good. (laughs) Okay. Have you actually started chemo treatment now? I did. I hit my first session, uh, not this previous Tuesday, but the Tuesday before that. Okay. So they've got you on a, what, a two week schedule or how, how are they? Schedule and about everything they can pump in there. They're trying to pump in there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, when I was going through chemo, uh, treat, see, I told you sometimes that chemo messes with your brain. (laughs) (laughs) When I was going through chemo treatment, uh, the, the chemo, okay, you got to do that, but you know, they, they gave me steroids also, and I kind of enjoyed that for a little yeah, while. I'll tell you that, you know, the first time I went through this, I had capricetabine, which is a pill form of it, and okay. uh, it was a daily form. Well, I kind of had to, I don't want to <laughs> bog it down with details, but it was a daily form, and I liked the pills, um, but it's a big difference to get the steroid bag and all the goodie bags and things like that. There is a yeah. perk to doing it through the old port and all that kind of stuff because yeah. I had kind of a couple days where the steroid was really good and a couple of days where um, it wore off and I was feeling a little bad. Yeah. And then, um, yeah. and then yeah, once really they wore stopped. off, that was it. I crashed. Okay. <laughs> I'm not taking it every day. So it's, it's kind of a yeah. different feel for sure. Yeah. Uh, they also occasionally had to give me a extra bag of potassium that, that would go <laughs> low and that would just make the session longer. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, pretty long. I don't know how long yours are, but they, it was seven plus hours, the first one for me. So hopefully oh, they'll get wow. it down to six. Yeah. yeah. They said well, get it to six, but we'll see. Mine would go two or three hours, maybe a little bit longer sometimes, but mm-hmm. um, that was long enough. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better today. I seriously am. Okay. Uh, well, I'm I'm thrilled to have you on this podcast, and as I stated in my introduction, uh, we want to help folks discover, sustain, or regain hope. And something I learned from you immediately is that you continue to express hope no matter the current situation, and that is so important for those of us who have true hope. And I I talk about in my teaching about hope, my writing about hope through the podcast, all of that, that that hope comes through our relationship with our Lord, true and lasting hope. Sometimes there's a challenge to it. Absolutely. Not every day is a wonderful, bright, sunshiny day, but we, we sustain our hope through that. So we'll, we'll talk about a little bit more about that as we go. But what I'd like to do is I'd like you to tell our audience a little bit about yourself and and some about your role with the Huntsville congregation. What does a campus minister do? Well, uh, something about me, I, I've had kind of a wandering, meandering path in life, I think, in general, but not an unpurposeful one. Um, I'm from Coal Valley, Illinois, originally, son of uh, two two teachers, and um, education was important to them, so I went to college, did the whole deal. I got actually my degrees in marine science. I didn't, I don't have a theology degree, um, and uh, so I was a science guy and thought I was going to go bounce around and do that, but about mid-20s, um, my life was really not going the direction I wanted it to go and uh, and felt kind of empty and unhappy, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to do something different. I was young, I was single, uh, and I uh, had no bills at that point. So I said, you know, I can go, maybe I can do some kind of mission work, but I don't want to be a missionary. I want to do vocational ministry, mission okay. work. So uh, for those of you who maybe are unfamiliar, vocational mission work is just when you move to a different country uh, because of the job that you have and you help a local congregation really by just helping pay the bills, <laughs> you know, but you, you join it and because there's more money generally in the U S than a lot of places out there. So, 
Um, I had a marine science degree. Anywhere there's an ocean, I could get a job, you know. So I thought, I'll go somewhere and, and work and just support the local church. But uh, through long, long stories, um, I ended up kind of being more of a traditional mi uh, missionary. And uh, if you've ever been a missionary, you know, you never stop. You could you come back home, but you're still a missionary. It doesn't it doesn't end. And so kind of bounced around and done a whole bunch of different things that I really believe God has led through. It's been an exciting, uh, interesting life for sure. And ended up in a lot of places I didn't expect. But one of those places is right here in Huntsville, Texas. Uh, I wasn't sure that um, I would end up in any kind of traditional ministry again afterwards. And uh, just from circumstances of things that had been happening, the last place I was in was Kalamazoo, Michigan. Somebody pointed me to college ministry, and, and I thought, well, maybe this is a good place, because I'd been working with a lot of people who were in, a, in college age or just out of college, and, uh, and I just saw a huge need when I was a missionary, I worked mostly with teens, but I realized that a lot of people fall off a cliff when they get to college, especially if they don't yeah. go to a Christian college, <laughs> um, but even when they come after a Christian college, they sometimes have a hard time understanding how to, to come back into a church setting afterwards. It was a it was a real gap, is what I felt like. And I thought, well, we're doing a lot of work with uh, high school ministry, but it seems to to continue that work, to really make it valuable. We need to help shepherd people all the way through the process. And so um, I thought, maybe this is the, the place I need to get into. And I just happened to be blessed through uh, fortunate circumstances, through the Lord, kind of making connections through things that I'd done in my past to, to be able to get a job here um, at Sam Houston State University. It's not really with the college, it's with Huntsville Church of Christ, but I work at Sam Houston State University, which is a uh, college of about 25,000 people and growing. It's on the north side of Houston up here. Uh, we're a little separated from Houston, but we're just getting bigger and bigger every year. It's obviously a pretty major college, and uh, the, how my min campus ministry is an odd duck no matter what. You have to kind of have, depending on the situation you're at, it probably means different things. But um, we do have a loose connection in the Churches of Christ of uh, campus ministries. And so you can kind of, if you ever are more interested in like what they do, you can look up Campus for Christ or something like that, and they'll, they can give you an idea of what people are doing out there. But for me, what it means is that the, the church bought a building here that was on the edge of campus about 60 years ago with the heart, with the idea, they actually bought somebody's house, <laughs> with the heart of like, let's create a campus ministry and let's, let's impact the students here. And uh, that faithfulness has just paid off over 60 years. The campus has actually grown up around us. We are we have a building that is is our own property that's smack in the middle of campus. Like right now, as I'm talking to you, about 150 feet to my right is the cafeteria, or one of the major cafeterias. 150 to the, my north is the major student center that's there in the center of campus. So we are like literally, and behind me are all the parking garages. So I'm like, you know, for me it was perfect because I can tell you what it's like. As a missionary, I went out to people, and uh, what it, it, you know, there's not a lot of funding in mission work. Whatever money was in my pocket is what funded me to do things. I went talk to people, which is great. Mm -hmm. It's mission work here. It's just six thousand new people come to me every <laughs> every year from different places. I just yeah. have to sit here and talk to them, and and we have obviously like a little bit more stability with funding and things like that, so we can offer um, some material things and, and that kind of things and just need meeting things for okay. people. On so I talk to people all day. I talk to college students all day. That's what I do. Tell them okay. about Jesus. I literally sit in the middle of campus and do that. <laughs> yeah. Now, now do you, uh, do you offer uh, Bible classes for students on campus? Uh, like all, all the Bible classes, Dave, <laughs> we have something on every, every day. It feels like, um, right. Okay. different. And, uh, and they can always have me personally. I'm available for personal study. This started at, you know, Texas used to have these things called Bible chairs where you would, yeah. um, yeah. you know, you could actually get college accreditation for your religious work and they'd have like your particular brand or whatever of a thing on okay. campus. So we used to actually teach active accreditation in the mid nineties that stopped. Um, but we still teach obviously, and we give people a chance to, uh, okay. so if you're a church of Christ kid and you're coming in here, you got something familiar that you can share mm -hmm. and you can also, you just, you didn't know if you came in here, but you're a missionary. <laughs> when you step in, yeah. Sam used to stay yeah. here, uh, you get to be a part of that. But if uh, the other kids that are out there, you know, there's opportunity. We're reaching people all the time. So, okay. yeah, constantly varying levels of from beginner all the way through. And the students yeah. lead some of those. The church members lead some of that. And I do some of that. All kinds okay. of stuff. <laughs> okay. So you now are a domestic missionary. Yeah, that's what I would say. Although... I feel like I still hang out with international people all the time. I've uh -huh. got, I mean, one of my major kids is a, a 
uh, you know, he was born in Japan. He's a Japanese, but his, his from a missionary family. His dad is American, but, you okay. know, so have that connection i've got somebody from singapore this year i got you know i just have people from okay. um, all different places who end up but yes mostly domestic people <laughs> well that's great because yeah. you can you can help them make the transition keep encouraging them to be faithful give them tools and knowledge and skills and then they go home you're doing something scriptural there so that's wonderful okay yes, sir. thank you so you're uh tell tell us about your family well, I, uh, I have a wife named Kara, uh, who I met while I was raising money for mission work, and she came over on a missionary trip. I promise you, I was not recruiting a wife at that time. <laughs> I was recruiting college students. She was going to Rochester College, which is Church Christ College that's up in Detroit area. And uh, from, I'd never been to Michigan before, but we met at a camp while she was um, recruiting for Rochester, and I was home raising money, and uh, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, yeah. You know? I used to tell everybody that uh, uh, all my youth group kids, you're dumb if you know. You think you know you can marry a girl within a year. Well, from the time of Kara and I deciding to date when she came over as a, a missionary in Australia to uh, the time we got married is about seven months. So the Lord will make okay. you eat your words at a yeah. <laughs> given time. But yeah. we, we got married, and um, we've been together now. Our anniversary, our 19th anniversary is actually next week. So yeah. okay. three kids. 11-year-old, 7-year-old, 4-year-old. We were in the mission field when we started and broke when we came back. We waited a little bit. And so I've got three youngish kids at home right now. They're all okay. lovely. Okay. And uh, lots of family out there, good ones. All right. Well, that's great. And, and I'm glad to hear that. Uh, it's good that you have that kind of a support uh, system there at home and, and an encouragement, all of that. that. That's just a big part of it. Let's transition a little bit now. This is your second round of fighting this disease. And so I, I, I kind of want to explore a little bit about your journey to hope. And, and that's, uh, of course, again, we, we want our listeners to, to learn about discovering, sustaining, and regaining hope. And I think you have a wonderful story to tell about that. You, you know, th this being your second time with it, how do you feel about it this time compared to the first time that you were diagnosed? You know, this is it feels different uh, this time for sure. But I think the previous time equipped me um, and prepared me because when you when you hear the word cancer the first time, no matter what, you go through a lot of evaluation of yourself, oh, yeah. and it can be painful. Um, but I I don't know. I, I've seen a lot of how God teaches and grows me through um challenges and i kind of have grown to like challenges if that makes sense and and so there's a blessing in um really evaluating your life and the first time i really went through uh a, a lot of i really felt the chill of the grave if that makes sense <laughs> um and uh and I, I really thought okay like what am i how am i leading my life and if i were to die tomorrow um, what would I be proud of and what would I not be proud of? And, you know, and there's a lot of things that I was happy with, but there were a lot of things that I thought, I don't, this doesn't make me feel good. And I don't want to no. die be mostly because I don't want to leave this kind of legacy behind. And so there's a weird kind of gifting in the sense of, of a really proper evaluation tool. <laughs> I am um, glad. I, <laughs> I am glad you said that word yeah. gifting, cause we're going to yeah. come back People don't understand sometimes they're being challenged with something very, very uh, powerful in their life, but they can look at it as you might have been given a gift. Now, we're, I want to come back to that later on, and, and let's chat about that. But um, Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, so I, yeah I, I felt like, and, I, and, you know, it's been two years, and I really honestly thought I was cancer free. I mean, because uh, of the circumstances of everything, I really thought that was a blip. I'm pretty young, you know, to, I mean, probably not anymore for, I guess, America, because colon cancer is on a crazy trend right now. But I was 46. I mean, they didn't even tell you to check your colon until 50, you know, for me. So I was 46 when I found out. And they said I'd probably had it for four or five years. So um, up to that point. So, you know, I'd had it for a while. And uh, this time, it's been different. Um, you know, I, 
obviously I'm, a, I'm an upgraded situation. I'm not stage three anymore. I was kind of the beginning of stage, I was like a stage three A before, uh, and now I'm a stage four. I'm not the worst stage four situation. I'm kind of in a different stage four because they're still treating for cure and not just for remission for me, and I actually have a decent chance, reasonably speaking, okay. of cure, so that helps. I'm, I feel like, uh, you know, I mean, you know, medically speaking, I want... Dave and I talked about this previous, for you guys out there, I don't know how much I put in the percentages or anything like that. It's up to God, honestly. Um, and I always think the, the data for percentages, this is a science guy in me, the data for science is, you know, is, is they've covered this for, what, 50, 75 years where they've really paid attention to this. We have centuries of who knows how many times God has intervened in these kind of things, yeah. you know, like in, in different ways. We don't we don't really know the true percentages. I think just basically maybe what the current trend is, but but he's given me a coin flip basically to cure it. And I think if it doesn't cure, you know, the the obvious result would be we're just going to try to treat it as much as we can and uh, get as much life out of you as we can if we we go from there. And you don't know, like you don't know how that's going to go. Um, but it's in my liver, which is not the best place to go <laughs> uh, okay. for cancer for you guys who are out there. So. But um, my, you know, so it's it's a different thing. I I definitely had the first moment when he said it's you know it's a liver, it's cancer. I thought, um, God's telling me I'm going to die probably. Um, but I've kind of walked back on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. And yeah, good it, thing. <laughs> it's it's been good a little bit. Uh, you yeah. know, well, I don't know that I it like as far as like the emotions considering it was that was the mystery of sadness. It's just I'm kind of I don't know about you guys out there. I'm logistical on some level. It's like. I kind of like to know how much time I have and, you know, sure. I want to make sure I use the most of it. So use it to the best. And if I've got to get stuff in order, I got to get stuff in order. And I, I'm in, in that spot. I need to get stuff in order. I, the Lord can use my body how he wants to use it. That's fine. Um, but, um, and if it's this way and if it's through death or something like that, okay. Uh, I, I signed up for that at 25 when I started the yeah. mission, like literally signed up and said, God, you can, you can do whatever with this body that you want. I'll scrub toilets. I'll do whatever. I didn't add cancer into the list there, but he obviously had that in his condition. Yeah. But it was on the table whether I said it or not, and I'm okay with that. But um, I don't know. I think that that has something to do with how I took the second one because there's been really my the faithfulness part of it is, is a huge factor for me in how I evaluate like the condition itself. The nervous energy for me and the thing that I feel bad about is – my kids, I have young kids, like I said, I really don't want to watch, have them not only just see me die, but maybe probably die in the bad cancer way, which is you get skinny and you, you know, and they have to watch that. And I have, yeah. I was in youth ministry. And so I have lots of people who have, have had to watch that happen to a family member. And it is traumatic um, for kids to see that happen. Um, and, you know, so that's that. If there's fear element of it, it's that, but the rest of it, it's like, okay, well, this is just the next thing on the list of what I said yes to a long time ago. So this, this helps me a little bit. I feel hopeful, really hopeful that yeah. uh, God's going to give me the Hezekiah treatment at least and give me maybe 15 more years. So I really want to get my kids out of, out of, <laughs> out of high school yeah. if I can do that. And, um, and yeah. just, some of it is just not that I don't trust God can uh, can take care of them through other people because I know that he can, but um, but that just, I, I'm at the good point in my life right now. Like, I'm loving the family. I'm loving, I, there's been a lot of struggle, um, and this is, like, probably the best moments. And I'm like, let me soak this in. Like, you know, let me enjoy my kids, and you know what I mean? Like, let me, I mean, I know I could probably enjoy them for the beyond, but I let me be in it with them. You know, enjoy it in this way, where I'm, like, rubbing elbows with them, but... Um, you know, if it goes the other way, there's there's reasons, and I I don't know, maybe because I've been chasing that for a long time. I just have seen always there's always reasons why God lets something. I don't think God does stuff to people that much, but as we we make it out, but I think God's there's reason God God lets it happen, and a lot of times it has to do with actually filling the deep desires of our hearts. So, whatever happens, happens. But I I really uh, have a lot of hopes that this isn't going to be the end of this iteration of this body yeah. <laughs> and, and yeah. go through i feel good about it i'm prepared good the only big moment i had really i i'm not gonna lie i cried when i heard i was gonna oh, be in four four chemo going, yeah <laughs> and i was gonna have a, a port you know i was gonna have to have the take-home port i gotta have two days of take-home port 
and because I had one chemo before and kind of had just gotten, I feel like I just started to feel better after about a year off of chemo where I was like back running again and life was good and I was okay. feeling good. And then it felt like it came out of nowhere, like that yeah. there was a new cancer spot and it's in my liver of all things. And, you know, um, it's just, you know, there's no good place after the colon anyways. And if I come back on the colon, they probably did take my whole colon and I don't have a colostomy bag right now, which is nice. If you have to have a colostomy, God bless you. No one's ju you know, judging, yeah. but it's yeah. nice to not have that. But I thought like my kids are going to have to watch me have this thing on me and I'm going to be killed. But I'll tell you what prayer works, man. The last two weeks, I felt mostly good. So okay, good. And the other great thing about it is, and this is so important for folks to remember is when you're diagnosed with cancer, it's not necessarily the death sentence it used to be, that they have Absolutely. made incredible yeah. strides in cancer treatment, cancer cures. Uh, so, yeah, that's what we do. You know, I want to chat just a few minutes about the idea of when we go through adversity, it can be a gift because now uh, with, with your experience, you will be able to talk with people at a level that you probably could intellectually, but now you can experientially, which is so much more powerful. You know, we say, yeah, I know how you feel. I know how you feel. And, and that's just so important, especially when we're trying to guide somebody to hope. So your thoughts on that a little bit about the idea yeah. of, of this, this can be a, a form of a gift. Yes, sir. Absolutely. With you 100%, Dave, on that. Um, I I always hesitate, you know, because because God allows it. I think sometimes people think, did God give you cancer? That's a deeper yeah, question. Right. We go right. in there. But I, I don't necessarily think that God necessarily, you know, if you look at the Job story, Satan gives, the, you know, the, the accuser gives him everything. God allows it to happen. But right. it's not God's idea in the first place. But right. yeah, God did not. I learned, yeah, I was kind of like, I was born and raised, you know, in to a generational Christian, and um, I was a, a I, I can't think of a time I didn't believe. I was always a believer, right? But, you know, I was kind of a believer that needed challenge. You know, I had been, my church was great and was really protective of a situation, but it wasn't really until I went out and I kind of flung myself across the world at 25 to Australia, where I was like living, you know, on, basically on my own. Um, where I started to really appreciate the that you know the struggle, you know, <laughs> the yeah. effort, the, you know, to lean into the challenges because like anybody who works out knows how do you get bigger muscles? You keep lifting weights right. and resistance. You change it up. Resistance is what builds the muscles, and you get to the point. I've been done some running in my life, which is ironic because I've always been a terrible runner and really had awful stamina <laughs> since I was a kid. But I, I kind of got roped into running. What you start to learn, people used to always asked me when I was do these big distances at a certain point, like, when does it stop hurting? And the, the answer is never. <laughs> like, it always hurts. But what happens is that you learn to lean into it. You actually kind of like some of the challenge. You like, you know, and there's something in me that, like, at that time, it started to lean into the challenges, which, you know, what happens is you see results. You get excited. You can do more things when your muscles grow or whatever in the exercise. Yeah. You can do more things. You can do more things. And so I think I, I'm always really inspired by Romans 8 when, when when Paul tells us that God isn't looking at us as servants, but adopted sons and daughters, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and we're basically of trust fund kids, right? <laughs> and what he's saying is like, what I'm training you for, I'm training you right now because you're going to at some point inherit the kingdom. And, and I want you to be responsible for that. And if you ever watch like the royal family or you get to see anybody who's of trust, trust fund kid, what do we want those people to do? We want them like, you know, the royal family, you want to see them go over to, it's be in the army. You want to go then see them hang out with people who are real people, right? Because they're about to have a bunch of riches. And if they don't understand what it's like to be in these bad situations, they might use, misuse those riches, right? And so for me, um, it's come to this realization of like, of, of I'm really kind of wealthy, maybe not in physically right now, but in, in the Lord, and it's just going to expand. The Lord is just preparing me to use these things correctly. And there's such gifting in it. And one, at one point, I'm not going to preach at you guys all the time but here, but, but <laughs> there's a point where Peter asked, Peter, the apostle, say to Jesus, they're like, 
we've left mothers and brothers to come be with you. And Jesus responds, you've received a hundred times as many, not just in the world beyond, but right now. That's so true for me right now. When you talk about yeah. family there, I talked about my nuclear family. It, look, one of the amazing things about this whole two-year journey and this year, people come from every phase of my life to say, Todd, we love you. We're glad you're on this earth. You know, we yeah. somebody once told me, they're like, I don't want to be a part of earth that you're not on. I'm like, well, you better pray. <laughs> but what a, you know, like a galvanizing thing of uh, it is where you realize that you have all this family. That's why I'm not as concerned. I mean, I'm, look, kids out there, if you're listening, go, I want to be your dad. I want to be yeah. there in person. But if it's not me in the end of it, Asher, Juliet, Nora, like yeah. I know my college students are already stepping in and, and doing that. And the people around are already doing this. So you get... What I'm saying is that I lost some things when I went to Australia. I missed my family, my friends. There were some things like that. But I didn't really end up really losing them <laughs> because okay. I, when I came back, you know, even then I kind of gained them even more because they meant more to me there, the things they said I needed to sustain me through there. But then I gained so much more on that. So I think, like, I kind of lean into the whole trial aspect of it. Like, God has got a lot of trial things that there's. A, he's always growing us, right? And that's not out of... Uh, you know, hatred, that's out of love. He wants us to have, as Jesus said, life to the full, not just any kind of life. And life to the full, if you're going to have muscles to the full, you're going to have to keep adding weight. <laughs> this just felt like, well, it's another thing to add weight to. And even if I physically die compared to this, I'm I'm sure what's waiting on the other side is just going to be part of the progression. It's just the end of the beginning, right? <laughs> like, yeah. and, uh, and the things that happened here will have mattered. But if I survive this and I, you know, and it's God's will to do that, you're a hundred percent correct, man. Like there's nothing like being able, like I've always done really face to face ministry with people, not kind of pulpit ministry. There's nothing of like being able to say, I kind of know what you feel like. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not a hundred percent exactly the same, That's right. but when, you know, I could not tell somebody before who was going through chemo and cancer, I know what you feel like. This week on Sunday, there's a lady who's got the exact same situation with me. Colon cancer, thought it was good, found out big tumor, and it's the same size tumor in her liver, right? I haven't talked to her very much at church at all. Pulled up next to her, we gave each other a big hug. That Inside that hug is a feeling that no one, unless you're going through it, you don't understand, yeah. right? And it's not yeah. that people are trying, it's like, it's not to diminish anybody out there, but there's something yeah. about being able to connect. So in some way, it kind of opened up more connection and love to her and maybe for me back again. So yeah. there are positives. I'm not saying I wish cancer on anybody. Um, and I'm glad it's yeah. me and not other people because <laughs> I don't want that to happen. I hope that my poor yeah. kids are going to be getting shot like age 12 probably. But, um, you know, because I got it so early. But, um, you know, these things, like there's nothing the devil can throw. There's nothing the other side can throw that God can't just turn around and make <laughs> make it like a positive right and a source yeah. of life yeah we serve we serve him uh, as he wishes us to but you know and, and i want to lead into another question that i'd like your perspective on when i was going through treatment and and even now uh, i would receive cards and emails from people and i have a basket at my uh, home office that is just packed full of cards that people sent me. And, and th that meant so much to me that, that these folks were there. Many of them I don't even know. People from foreign countries that I didn't even know but knew somebody found out about this and would write me. And it just it truly, truly meant a lot to me. And I will keep those cards forever. I have them where I can see them every day. And, and so that, that just meant so much to me. And one of the things that, okay, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit here, and I want to turn it over to you, is I, I think you've experienced it as well. Um, the idea that uh, I had to learn some things. When, it, when I was first told by my doctor, okay, you have leukemia. I already knew something was wrong. You have leukemia, and uh, this is the situation. I... I kind of felt sorry for myself there for, for a few minutes, you know. Uh, there's a bench outside the door of the cancer center that um, I remember sitting on that bench. I called it my pity bench. <laughs> uh, I was talking with a young lady this uh, week early that has been, uh, she's handicapped from cerebral palsy for her entire life. 
And she says, we have a rule around our house that uh, you can feel sorry for yourself for three minutes. She calls it the three minute rule. And she says, after yeah. that, you, you come to grips with it. And, and I thought about that uh, in, in my experience. Yes, I, I, it's okay to go through those human emotions when you're challenged like that. But then you have to come to grips with it and, and uh, you have to accept, okay, this is the situation. And, and I tell people, don't focus on what you cannot do. Focus on what I can do. And that's why I say there's a possibility that um, we can look upon these adversities as gifts. Now, where I want to go with the next question, it is amazing to me how many people were focused on supporting me uh, in the hospital, outside of the hospital, at the cancer center, and all of those things. So talk about the people who supported you and, and how they helped. And, and here's my intent, kind of give your thoughts a little bit there. People need to know they do not walk alone. There are people out there who understand, who care, and so don't shut yourself in. You are not alone. So anyway, talk about the people who supported you. Yeah, it's crazy, like a ton of people out there. But I, I think, you know, if you're somebody who's just received the news or you're in the middle of the news and you think, I don't know if anybody cares, <laughs> you know, yeah. like what happens if it's going to happen? You know, yeah. one thing I'll tell you for sure, just on a support level, and one of the positive things about having to go to the infusion center and the chemo center, I don't know, at least my experience has been those nurses genuinely care. Like, aren't they uh, amazing? Guy, ladies, whatever. <laughs> they care whether you live or die. They hug with you. I, my doctors, I, you know, I don't know how you're an oncology doctor for, you know, my, one yeah. of mine, I just retired after 25 years and I'm onto a new one, but I was like, I don't know how you make it 25 years doing it. Cause it's yeah. such heavy lifting. Right. But those people genuinely care whether you live or die. And uh, they care whether your day sucks or not, um, you know. So you, you start to see that. I, I think sometimes we feel like they, the world is a cruel place and no one really cares out there. Um, pe there are people out there who care. They just genuinely care. Not always, I mean, not always just Christian people. I'm talking, there's just people out there who, yeah. are, they care that it, what's happening to you. And, uh, and I see that, I mean, social media has really helped on some level for me because I, yeah. I I'm connected to a lot of people. So I'm kind of blessed with the wealth of people who have been connected. I'm in, in a good age group for somebody who's connected in a variety of different ways because I've been connected by social media for a long time. But yeah, um, people do all kinds of things. They bring food over, like somebody brought, one of the ladies from church brought um, food over for us for a couple of days to take care of the kids. My college students come yeah. over and babysit the kids. Uh, spent the night with him, like when we knew I was about to start chemo, my wife and I wanted the night away, you know, and uh, and we had people come over and spend the night and with the kids and they come over and do art with them and things like that. Money right now, I, uh, you know, people are giving me money, which is good. I, I don't have great insurance and I was a missionary, so I did not have a nest egg uh, yeah. <laughs> much much right. to put it out. And, uh, you know, people will help you financially. Right now, there's people who give find not just prayers but financially that i've never met and they just know yeah. somebody who knows somebody it's crazy to me um yeah. their connections to people out there people who share stuff about me and the prayer i feel personally i mean i'm always soliciting prayer um because we're in the age where people kind of hate the idea of thoughts and prayers and i've really been trying to defend prayer because i'm like if you don't if they don't want your thoughts in prayer, I want, <laughs> even Let, if you're not a believer, I, I feel like a thought is kind of like a prayer. So even yeah. if you're not a believer and you're just wishing goodwill, bring it over towards me, but I can literally feel the goodwill sometimes. Like I think I get out of bed and I don't feel as yeah. nervous. I really feel like I'm doing this with other people. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing. It's not just, it's just the thing about cancer. I think I mentioned this before, Dave, you know, my wife said it, cancer isn't just happening to you. It's happening to all of us. And, yes. and, it, I feel it with my church family, with my friend family, like what's happening to me is happening to them. And it's like their own body and they feel connected to it. So yeah, look, the, it's, you can't do this without support for sure. I mean, it very easily, but you could with the Lord's help, but, yeah. but I mean, let me tell you what, it makes it a whole lot easier to handle things. And especially for me, the end of life stuff, you really have to think about that, right? Stuff can happen. It's there. And 
Yeah. It can happen. Um, I have hope, but I also am realistic. Like, it could happen. The biggest source of anxiety for me and fear is what happens to these people I love afterwards. What burdens will they have? What debts will they have? What what is it going to be? And when people step in and do that kind of stuff, it alleviates so much of that for me because I think, well, you know, if I'm not here, they're going to be taken care of. Yeah. <laughs> right? You know, you mentioned, um, so. you, you mentioned about prayer. I, I had a conversation with my wife while I was in the hospital and I was looking at some of the cards and somebody said, you know, we're praying for you. And I commented to her, I physically feel the prayers yeah. that people, it, yeah. it was amazing. I mean, I understand prayer and participate in prayer, but it was a whole new level. And man, I appreciated that. Like nobody, yeah. you've been through it. <laughs> you understand. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yes. But you know, I there's just so it. many it's a, it's a weird thing, guys, but honestly, I can feel it. So please keep them coming because that's right. even if, if it was end of life stuff at least i feel good <laughs> during it you know because that's the other thing you feel it's like am i gonna just feel really bad until i die it at least if i was gonna go out i'll go out feeling pretty good and uh and what people won't just remember me it's like you know <laughs> yeah well it, it not only helped me uh, again i felt it but it helped me when i turned that around and would have my conversations with the lord um mm -hmm. it it again it just puts put it at a whole new level. It was really something. Well, all righty. Anything else you want to chat with us about? I Look, I love people, Dave. I've got I can see that. worth of conversation that I would love to just talk to you about. But I, just to share with people out there, for sure, Dave, Dave's thing is hope. Y'all, there's so much hope. And if you need some some of mine, uh, Dave could probably put you in touch. <laughs> but uh, go ahead, Dave. Let's put that out there. But for real, um, there's a blessing. There's blessings to be found. I, this, I find little flowers in all of these dark alleys, you know. I mean, even in the yeah. chemo the other day, I was dreading it. It's long. I was thought I was going to be really sick. I came away energized, not just because of the steroids, but <laughs> I loved – I met a bunch of new friends in there. You yes. know, I met a bunch of, there's a guy across from me, 10 years, he's had blood cancer, 10 years. And I was like, how do you do it, dude? And he's like, I get one day for chemo. He's every two weeks. It's like, yeah. I give, I take one day off. I still mow the lawn. I still travel. I do everything. And you see that and you're like, yeah, in his life, he could tell he, he enjoys his life still. It's, it's good. I think particularly a cancer nurse, they just, they're there's amazing something about that group. That is incredible. So you, if you're one of those people, thank you out there. Yeah. You really do bring but you'll meet a whole bunch of new friends in, in the in the infusion center when you're stuck with three hours, nothing to do but talk. Mine doesn't even have Wi-Fi, so yeah. <laughs> we got to talk to each other. But um, yeah. Anyways, but God bless you guys, everybody out there. I'll be pr I'll be praying for you all out there. You pray for me, but um, yeah, keep keep the hope up. Absolutely. Okay. Well, Todd, it's been wonderful having you as a guest. And, you know, you've got a dynamic spirit about yourself that I think is going to help you through this, but it's also going to show other people uh, what true and lasting hope is. And as I said, you know, that, that comes from our relationship with the Lord. The closer we draw to our Lord, the greater and more sustaining our hope is. And it's not a sense of desperation. That That's another thing I don't want people to think. Uh, I have nowhere else to turn. I might as well turn to the Lord. doesn't work that way. We turn to the Lord, and He's there with us every step of the way. I agree. I have hope itself as a, a, a as a being, as a friend, and that does make a big difference. For yeah. Sure. But if somebody uh, if somebody's facing challenges, we we certainly want to help them uh, spiritually mm -hmm. as well as uh, any other way that we can. All hey, right. and the Lord Himself said, "Take this cup away from me." So you know, it, it, you don't have to be positive all, all the time. It's I'm not positive all the time, but can't be. Um, but too many prayers coming in for me to feel negative for too long. So <laughs> yeah, it, it, we can, we, it, it's sure we cannot be positive all the time, but uh, we, we know that there's so much more than what we're going through right now. And you've, you've spoken to that very well. Okay. Well, let me wrap up. And again, Todd, thank you so much for being a guest. And I'd love to have you back on later uh, as we're going through things. Let's, let's chat some more sometime. My pleasure. Okay. Well, friends, thank you for joining me as together we journey to hope and that we have encouraged you to discover, sustain, or regain hope through this effort. 
I invite you to contact me if you have any questions or comments, or if you wish to share with me something you've experienced in your journey to hope. My email is ourjourneytohope at gmail.com. That's our journey and the number two, hope at gmail.com. And please share this podcast with someone whose hope is being challenged. I look forward to sharing more with you soon. Again, I'm Dr. Dave Layton, and thank you for listening. And until our next episode, remember, and Todd, I know you agree with this, we give all glory to God our Father.